Okay. Okay, I'm Will Milstead, uh, license training operator. I'll explain that licensing as we go. <coughs> okay, what is amateur radio? Wikipedia's got a definition for us. Basically, it's a lot of people who find radio fascinating and the magic of making signals go from one place to another without any wires is fun. Actually, described as playing radio. Um, the International Amateur Radio Union describes it as the greatest of all scientific hobbies. It is very heavy on the technical. If you want it, you can go out and buy a box and you need one license. You just use that. You never need to know the details of what's in it. But otherwise, if you're appropriately licensed, you can build all your own equipment, everything from scratch, as much as possible. Brief word about licensing. Ofcom is the responsible body in the UK for licensing. And there's few types of licenses. The most common thing you come across, broadcast licenses given out to the BBC, ITV, etc., Sky and so on. They are licensed broadcast. Licensed equipment, um, there's what's also called license exempt, you know, Bluetooth devices, mobile phones, etc. That equipment is licensed to transmit. If you transmit in the UK, you have to have a license on the equipment. License exempt is the equipment that matches certain criteria. For example, a remote control car key. It's a radio transmitter. And it's license exempt, theoretically, i.e., the equipment has been licensed because it's very low power, short range. PMR, personal mobile radio. Sort of thing the uh, security guards use. Um, please don't quite use that, they people back them off the mobile phone with them now, which is why, in the event of a major emergency incoming, the mobile phone call, because the police have swapped all the network. They, they've got priority channels for emergency services. They grab all the channels that are available. And then the other type of licensing is operator licensing. I the person operating the radio equipment is licensed, not the equipment. That comes into maritime, for example, you can get a ship's operator's license, which is valid worldwide, or you can get an amateur license. It's here. There's three levels of amateur license in the UK. Foundation, which is an N3 or an M6 call sign, and allows you to operate on most bands up to 10 watts. Intermediate, you're allowed access to all the bands, all the different modes of operation, up to about 50 watts. Some bands are still restricted. And then you get the full license. All the bands that are available, and you can go up to 400 watts. Um, I've got a full license. Most I push out from these armors, so not a major amount. Scaling off that. There are various aspects to amateur radio. The bands, I've been speaking about bands. There's lots of bands, some people point out there's BLF and LF as well. Um, yes, if you've got that gun that's two kilometers long, you can do BLF dead easy. Um, we have a band down at that wavelength. 136 kilohertz, you can almost hear it. Um, <coughs> and all the way up to microwave. And there are some people experimenting with light mode, point to point mode radio. Because um, that's, unli that's unlicensed, provided you keep the uh, laser power down to sensible levels. Um, there's some special modes repeaters and internet links, for example. Yeah, we use the internet. We do voice over IP. We did it before anyone else, actually. But still, it's there. Packet. It's a format way of doing the internet. Um, very low data rate. I 600 is still pretty common. Like that. So you won't get web pages in the area. It will do. DX cluster, um, I'll mention more around that later. And satellites. Again, there's a bit more detail on that coming up. Uh, modes, I've mentioned about modes. 
There's various modes you can do, voice, obviously. Morse, we still use Morse code. I'm still trying to learn it. Um, I'm not sure about four letter words, just about the right there, but right characters in there. Uh, data in packet, as we mentioned, and slow scan TV, still images. You can also do fast scan TV, i.e., full speed TV. Now, people are starting to experiment with digital HD TV compared to bands. Usually on, on microwaves, because the bandwidth requirements. Various other things, uh, QSL cards. You've had a contact with someone from a remote country, you can exchange postcards effectively. I've got a set of postcards printed off of my call sign. My best, rarest one I've had so far has been Vatican City. They are not very similar facing here. Um, contests. There's a big one starting in an hour and a half. Um, the IOTA contest, the Islands on the Air. Because we're in Ireland, we're quite sought after for that. And uh, that's going to be going for 24 hours. You can make as many contacts as you can, and as many, many islands as you can. And you get points. And then you can get rewards for doing so many continents. And I will one day get the 100 country award. I'm just trying to get that. Right, the electromagnetic spectrum we mentioned about before a bit. Some of these slides might be very familiar if you've done the foundation course. Um, we split it up into bands for the radio, um, from VLF, way down a kilometre or more wavelengths, up to millimetres in wavelength. And there are specific bands in that region that are available for amateur use. Um, special modes. Repeaters and internet links. Repeaters, VHF, UHF radios, limited range. They won't go much beyond the horizon. Um, so, and, and the hills are great at stopping them. So you put a repeater in the middle, and we can take a signal from one radio, one side of the hill, pass it on to one the other. Now, of course, the consequence of that is, if you're acting as a go-between, you can actually have two of them connected via the internet or via phone lines, etc. And you can get much greater distance. And uh, there is a whole, there are a couple of internet based networks of repeaters, such that I've heard a New Zealander speaking to an American on a, my handheld on VHF, on VHF even. It's possible. You also have to keep with the time zones, but that's fine. It's only my imagination. Packet, as I said, data. Um, Starting off with just simple async data between computers. Um, what more to say? It's just like a serial number between two computers. It can be expanded up to full TCP IP stacks with um, appropriate data transfer. The DX cluster, it's an internet and radio based system and packet based. Um, for spotting remote stations. PX is hand radio speak for long distance communications. You should, used to be out of the country, it's now out of continent. Um, because we can do so much greater distances easier. Um, the DX cluster lists rare stations or rare countries that have been uh, spotted by somebody. So you work at the station, you talk to them, communicate with them. If you want other people to spot it, you post it on the DX cluster. And then within a minute or two, it gets spread worldwide that this station is available. Tell them the frequency and everything. Satellites. There are a lot of amateur radio satellites up there. We've got one passing visibly in a, at about 1.30. Um, might be able to go if we. Well, they have really had success. The ISS, unfortunately, isn't. We've missed all today's passes. The next ones are early tomorrow morning. I've already checked. Moon bounds, exactly what it says. You point an antenna at the moon and bounce a signal off the moon. And hopefully, somebody else will receive it. It's a way of doing 
long distance VHF. The antennas to do wind belts are big. They tend to be trailer mounted and it's four or more antennas pointing at the moon. Repeaters, that's what a repeater looks like. Um, typical repeater. That's a big one actually. Um, it's range from limited range signals such as um, VHF, UHF over the hills. And if it's fine enough, you might see up the top there's an IP cop firewall. Great. That's a bit of a open source. Um, Echo Link is one of the systems that allows you to link up system radios. I've even got a copy of the Echo Link client software on my phone so I can. I've got Wi Fi or a good eye 4G signal, I can actually speak anywhere in the world via my phone without costing a penny. <laughs> but I need to know radio amateur. Um, it's a worldwide system. Repeaters are their own branch of the hobby that take a lot of that activity. Uh, packet, it's dying in some areas. It used to be these original modems, very light phone modems, very light, and they just don't have the telephone interface. They have a straightforward audio and out interface. It's been superseded by software, because PCs have got so fast and so easy to use and hook up that it's done by sound cards modems now. So you just hook the radio to a sound card, run the appropriate software. Which there's a lot on the minute. It's not an area I'm filling with, so I don't do much with it. Um, and the box there, the TMC, has been replaced purely by software. PS cluster, as I mentioned about, shows long distance radio stations that are available. Um, available on a packet radio, Telnet. Yeah, you can tell them to serve boxes and just put up text and all stations appearing as they appear. And then some people have done web interfaces to it. Satellites, they're fun. Most of the amateur radio satellites are in low Earth orbit. Um, sometimes they're uh, higher than the ISS, but most are lower. And um, yeah, they work quite nicely. There's some uh, out there that they're mostly on VHF and UHF. There is one still on HF, or at least HF on one of the uplinks, because you tend to put the uplink and the downlink in different bands. It was a bit interesting problem with Doppler shift, which makes it interesting. <coughs> um, a common one that you can work with um, a small radio, an FM handheld, for example is SO50, which um, uses UHF and VHF uplinks and downlinks. Great program in, it's there. You can also sometimes pick up the telemetry on the satellite, so you can monitor the temperature of the satellite, the power consumption on it, and such. It's amazingly low on some of these. Obviously, it's line of sight communication when they're above the horizon, so you have to know when they're going to say five to ten degrees above the horizon, when they're going to get into that area that they're going to drop below the horizon quickly. Called an AOS acquisition signal or LOS loss of signal. Usually there's some software to predict it. G predict um, works, G predict as in no. Um, G predict will has a massive access to a massive database of satellites. Will tell you when there's going to be a satellite coming above the horizon for you. It will also show on a map the footprint and you can tell you the frequencies and when you're going to be able to see the satellite, see as in pick it up on the radio. I've used that, it's very good. It's good, it's a brilliant piece of software. <coughs> Aris. Aris is uh, getting a lot. Of activity at the moment because the uh, Tim Leak, the UK astronaut, who's going up, has scheduled a set of 10 schools to talk to people. 
this was released yesterday, one round here, unfortunately. So I know the board members of Premier have put in an application for it and were on the short list before it went on to the final list. Um, there's several ways you can get the ISS. I've heard it, I've never spoken to him yet. I've made calls, but I've never spoken to him yet. Um, if an operator is licensed and has got free time, they might come on the radio. But we're fitted with the work schedule. And there are actually two amateur radio clubs on the ISS the American one or the Russian one. And they won SS. And RA zero ISS in the course lines and class. Um, here in the UK, we get about six minutes when the ISS is above the horizon and we can make contact. It's difficult because it's always approaching us from over the North Atlantic. And so, operating with free time is unlikely to be on radio because there's you can't talk to many people on that way. So we tend to get a Russian, and they're interested in Eastern European and Russian contacts rather than us. But it can happen occasionally. Right, modes, voice. We use just about any mode of contact. Some people like recording the calls as they make them. Audacity is great for that. Most people have this Morse, as we call it, CW. Um, there are also loads of software to do with Morse. It will take the Morse code, decode it, encode it, etc. Um, decoding is difficult if it's a human operator, because they don't output the Morse at a fixed speed. But it's still possible. <coughs> Data and packet modes. We've got some very slow packet modes, uh, data modes, sorry. FL Digi is great for doing the job. Again, open source, heavily maintained, and it just did at least cheap Thursday, I think it was. People moaning about it. It's not working in various modes, but it does do the job. Um, FL Digi, fantastic bit of software. Um, I can demonstrate later if needed. Slow scan on TV. Um, works usually on HF on SSB, single sideband transmission. It takes time to display a picture, two to three minutes to do a full screen image, and it tends to be noisy. There are some digital modes that come in that are being experimented with, which get over this. And so we're doing slow scan TV digitally on frequencies lower than the bandwidth. HDTV. <coughs> right, other uses. Um, contact logging, you can suppose somebody you log in. Especially if you're in a contest, you've got to upload a log showing who you're spoken to. Placing the manufacturer's software, because some of the manufacturer's software is awful. And can you think designing equipment might be able to do it? Hand drawn. Um, Circuit diagrams is a pain by comparison. I've done it, I've done it for years, but rarely do it uh, nowadays. And laying out PCBs by hand is hard work. So, contact logging. Uh, what I tend to use CQR log uses MySQL back end. No, they haven't done it many before we say we can talk to post press. But now I've got MariaDB, I'm not happier about it. Uh, K log X log. There's very, there's more, there's almost as many logging programs as there are um, amateurs using Linux. <laughs> right. EDIF is an XML like file format which is standardized across the logging programs. And Team QSL, it's a certificate driven method of transferring the files. With the ADIF log files, it guarantees it's you that created the file and uploaded it and downloaded it actually. Now I come to my little particular area of interest, chirp. Um, replacing manufacturer software. 
A while ago, I bought this Romeo. Uh, nice little VHF, UHF handheld. Um, well, it was beautiful. It's got a nice amount of memories. And you can program it via the keypad. Or you can program it with the manufacturer's software. However, the manufacturer's software doesn't allow you to import a CSV file or anything like that. You can't import the data. What you can do is save the backup of the radio data. Very important from another, save it on the radio. And save the firmware, which is even worse. So I looked at Chirp, which was I'd used on other radios, and it works fine. However, they didn't have a driver for this. So if you've got one of these Voxel radios, and you use Chirp with it, blame me. I wrote the driver for it. Um, in this case of reverse engineering the protocol the radio uses to talk to the PC and then working out the formats of the memory in which to be downloaded. Um, CHIRP is supposedly stands for Chinese or cheap handheld radio interface program. That's not quite enough, really, the letters. Electronic design. So if you're doing CAD, um, KeyCAD, there's a load of different open source bits of uh, software to do um, CAD design and electronic circuit design. Nice thing I find about KeyCAD, once you get used to some of its vagary, there's some sponsorship from CERN. Um, I think the project is actually based at Zurich University. It's uh, quite widely supported. There's loads of open source libraries of the parts into it. It's great for doing electronic design. And it does everything from the circuit diagram, so you can draw a circuit diagram, all the way to the PCB design. There is some auto routing, it's not the world's best auto router. It tends to try and use two sides where you can insert a lot if you do a little bit of careful crafting, you can make it single sided good. And circuit simulation, SPICE, there are tools to do it. It's not something I'm really bothered with, but it is possible. That's the end of the presentation. However, uh, one extra thing to add here, I was very quickly demonstrating earlier, a piece of open software that's gaining a lot of popularity is um, WebSDR. This is an overlap between software defined radio and the website, the web, generally. And there are a lot in the load of SDRs out on the internet running this software, and you can listen. You can't transmit, but you can listen to almost any frequency. Now, um, one at the University of Twente here covers the entire HF band. There's a picture of the uh, SDR itself. Normally, they won't even release the design for it. It's a great pity because it's a um, fantastic little board. Um, the connector here, the stereo, that's an Ethernet connector. Sorry. No, won't quite go away. But what I tend to use, because it's fairly near me, is the one that had green up in Cheshire. And we can go and we can listen So if you use it, if you play with SDRs, the image will display will be fairly common. Um, almost 20 meters. There's a problem. And this is live, going on in the moment. Also, if you're a licensed amateur, this is great for checking that your signal is getting it. You find a free section of the player, tune into this, key up, then start to you can we'll see if your signal is going out and how strong it is. Well, I think that's about it that I wanted to show you. So, questions, maybe to everyone else. Well, the same as we've got a few advice, we have to do it. 
Um, each license requires you to sit at the exam which is multi choice. The foundation license is 26 questions, um, and you also have to carry out some practical assessments, which I'm a registered assessor, so I can sign them off. Um, the easiest way of doing it is to sign up to a with one of the radio clubs to a training course. It's about 12 to 18 hours of training um, to get you on air. And then it's a 55 minute exam. I say 26 questions, multi choice, you've got to score 19 and above. Okay. And, and I run the courses in all Hampton, so. <laughs> uh, what do you think of actually with the difference between the three levels? What, what, what are the main differences? Um, the bands, and when you go on to the higher licenses, you can start doing unattended transmissions within certain restrictions, and you can operate radios by remote control. So, for example, I could set up the, my radio in the car to be a repeater, I could talk to it with my handheld, and then go out on a different band. Um, so, I could increase the power from five watts from the handheld. One watt on the handheld up to 50 watts on the radio in the car. Turn the battery very quickly. <laughs> it's possible to do things like that. And also on the high end, which you can do uh, full speed TV, live TV, standard definition or high definition. So, yeah, there's more privileges the higher the license goes. And when you're on full license, you can supervise people. I haven't got licenses, but I've started a training course to do it. Okay, next. I really want the licensing means that we can transmit. Do we have any licenses with this? This is always a, a that's a grey area, actually. Um, if you're a licensed to transmit, you are also then licensed to listen on any, almost any frequency. Um, there are certain frequencies that uh, do cause interesting questions about licensing. Um, there, for example, there is the UHF band, or the early UHF band, um, 431 to 432 megahertz. You're not allowed to transmit on within 100 kilometers of Charing Cross. The reason it's Charing Cross is because the other side of the river is this big silver building that uses that frequency, which I won't mention who's <laughs> <It's> there. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's restrictions. So theoretically, you're not even allowed to listen on those frequencies within 100 kilometers, which is about Oxford, um, as a rough drive. Um, there are certain other frequencies that are regarded as sensitive. Um, that said, the yeah, SDR dongles, um, you can cover just about it. All the frequencies up to mid microwave or low microwave. So it's, it's a question of what you do with what you hear and perceive as much as anything. Um, the aerials for these things then must come in quite a variety. You yes. have a, a small one there, but I'm sure you yeah, this is a, this is a helicopter which is not the best. A quarter wavelength, which would be normal, which I've left at home for size, about that one, twice as long. Um, the HF radio that I've got, if I use a wire antenna on, it's 20 meters long. It's just 20 meters of a single strand of wire. Two strands. <laughs> um, you want to work. The VLF, you need a kilometre, theoretically, of wire, and there are ways of shortening it. Well, you actually have a kilometre of wire, but you can coil it up to save space. But yeah, um, you can fit an HF antenna in most gardens, and there are solutions if you can't. Could you hijack the, the telephone wire that's outside your house? No, you never do anything like that, of course, <laughs> never do that. <laughs> I can't because mine's underground. <laughs> but there are stories of people hijacking that. Yes. 
especially as a lot of the, um, BT engineers are actually working on it as well. I'd say, given that uh, the people that are using these like, um, in, in house power Ethernet transmitters oh, are hijacking the uh, Amazon vans, and I don't see any reason. Yeah, for that, um, that is a very painful area. Um, PLT devices, as they know, are supposed, if they're, good, if they're properly CD tested, they are supposed to detect a radio transmission and shift frequency. However, the cheap Chinese imports that you'll find on the circuit auction site are rarely CD compliant. Interestingly, a big organisation based in Cheltenham, or the Big Donut building, actually building, and you can't see clearly on Google Maps because they make it fuzzy. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, has got Ofcom some more powers, such that it used to be that if you had a device that was causing interference to radio, to radio of any sort, Ofcom could come and say, your device is causing interference, can you please switch it off? And they, you could quite rightly say, legally say, go get it stuffed. Um, I'm not going to stop using this. However, in the past few months, because of this organisation in Cheltenham, the uh, Ofcom have been given some teeth. You can now be fined up to £10,000 for continuing to operate such a device if Ofcom have served you with notice you should stop. And I believe if they can, if necessary, take it further and confiscate and throw you in prison. Purely because this organisation down in Cheltenham, which we won't name, um, were finding that it was interfering with their ability to move strong. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. any more? Um, yeah. um, we're going to get this business of smart metering uh, rolled out in the next year or two or three. Perhaps. Is the transmission by radio or is it by the... Uh, My the understanding is going to be by the power lines. It's not quite easy. It's a, a zip meter or half a shell that's into your intersection. Right, okay. I can say this because I go to work for it. It's fine. I want you to go to work for it. You have to go to work for it. And if you don't have to go to work for it, some of them use uh, three G conditions. Yeah. And the... I want you to be great for the all-extra G sims and... You don't need much data yeah. to transform me to read it. Yeah. 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 The um, the other thing is some got some um, states actually all go back to central so not central so states. There's the answer. <laughs> so it's all very, very well, there's not very much of a standard, and you can't even swap meters to do it like they do. So it's the usual choice standard. Which standard do you want? <laughs> but if you want any of the kind of smart stuff that allows you to work and join thermostat, then that's all you need for. Okay. Are we done?